All right, so first thing we're going to do is take a derivative. <coughs> so I'm going to take an x derivative of a function plus a number. So it is f prime plus, what's the derivative of any number? Zero. Zero. So what this means is what was stated yesterday, that you can add a constant and doesn't ch it doesn't make what you're writing down not the antiderivative. So antiderivative, there's actually an infinite number, and it's the antiderivative plus some constant. So you can't really say the antiderivative. You have to say an antiderivative. So there are infinite antiderivatives of any function of f of x. And they're of the form. We <coughs> use capital F. So that part doesn't change, but your constant, you don't know what the constant is. Is there a way to narrow it down? Yes, uh, with initial conditions, basically. Um, so f of x will be the same function, and c can be any constant. So c can be anywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity. And what we're going to do is, with an initial condition, we'll be able to figure out what c is. So if we call our initial condition well, it's better just to do an example, I think. So we have a package is dropped from a hot air balloon. air balloon ascending at a rate of 12 feet per second at a height of 80 feet. Gravity has a downward acceleration of 32 feet per second squared. How long does it take for the package to hit the ground? So we have measurements in three different units. We have a 80 foot measurement, which is a distance or a displacement. We have a foot per second measurement, which is velocity. And we have a foot per second squared, which is acceleration. So how are position, velocity, and acceleration related? So if I have position function, I think S of t was the position function. Usually they used S of t. So if S, S of t is position function at time t, S prime of t 
which you could write as V of t, is the velocity at time t, and S double prime of t is the derivative of the velocity, which is the acceleration at time t. So let's see what information we start with. We don't actually get any equations, so we're going to have to create our own. So I see, I know the initial height, I know the initial velocity, but I don't know uh, anything other than initial conditions for the velocity and the height. Now gravity, 32 feet per second squared, gravity is going to pull the same amount the whole time. So what I can say is the acceleration is going to be constant. The only force is going to be downward pull of gravity, and it's going to be the same the whole time. So I can write the acceleration function is constant downward acceleration So that means my A of t function is very easy to write. So it's a constant function. I can either go with 32 or negative 32. So let's do negative 32. So up will be positive, down will be negative. So the acceleration function is relatively easy because all we have is gravity going, accelerating down. Now obviously we drop, when we drop the package, the velocity is going to change the longer it's been falling for. So we have to be way more careful about the velocity. Ascending is what? Up or down? Up. But remember, ascending is not, it refers to the, the initial rate or the initial velocity. All right, so any questions on this constant acceleration function? All right, how do I take acceleration and get velocity? Almost. So we're going to go the opposite way. So we're starting at the bottom, and we're going that direction, basically. So before, last section, we started at, or last chapter, we started at position, and then got derivative and derivative. Now we're going to start at the bottom and go antiderivative, antiderivative, yeah. Do we need to know the, like, the order of derivatives and what they are exactly, or what do you say on it? You need to know, yeah, uh, this recall, you need to know this right here. So I need to know that acceleration is the derivative of position. Oh, uh, uh, derivative of velocity, and velocity is derivative of position. Yes. Uh, you can also look at units. Positions in this problem is measured in feet, and then the velocity is feet per second, and then the acceleration is feet per second squared. So you can do a unit analysis, basically, which is a very physics thing to do. So if you ever forget, just think, well, what, you know, if you think of miles as your distance, miles per hour as your speed, and then your acceleration is, it's a little weird units, but it's miles per hour squared, right. would be your acceleration. Okay. Um, two questions. Number one, what are we going to have for a final? And are we going to be dealing with the third derivative at any time between now and the end of the quarter? Yeah, so I think I've only taken a third derivative a few times, but you just take derivative and then take the derivative and take the derivative again. So it's, you just take three derivatives okay. in a row. Uh, what we're about to do is do two in antiderivatives in a row. So gravity is down. So our velocity prime is the acceleration. So now I'm going to find the anti-derivative. All right, we are doing, now we're not doing an x antiderivative, we're doing a t antiderivative. So what function has a derivative of negative 32? It needs to be a function of t. Uh, negative 32t. 
Yep, so negative 32t. You can always guess and check. Negative 32t, derivative is negative 32. We're taking a t derivative, not an x derivative now. What do I also have to add on? Plus constant. Yep, so we still get that plus constant. All right, so that is our v of t function right there. Now, I don't know what our c value is, but we can go back to the problem and look. Our initial rate is 12 feet per second. So our initial velocity is 12 feet per second, and it's going to be downward. No, upward. upward. So initial velocity, that means time is zero. That's right when we're starting our, uh, our drop. And t equals zero, so that's v of zero. And they said v of zero was 12. Uh, you can write units if you want, but I'm just going to write v of zero equals 12. And that's 12 going up. Uh, v of zero is also negative 32 times zero plus c. So I'm using the v of t function, but plugging in 0. All right, 32 times 0 is 0, so c is 12. So now I can write my full v of t function with the proper number in for c. So there is my velocity. So when t is 0, you get 12. And then as t increases, your velocity uh, is going to actually decrease. That's our velocity. Now we're going to go for the position. Position function. Uh, s prime of t is v of t. So we need to find the antiderivative. So we're going to do guess and check. I'm going to take a guess. All right, the 12 is easy. Derivative, antiderivative is 12t, just like the last problem, or the last step that we did. All right, so I took a guess. I just increased the power of t from 1 to 2. Now I'm going to take a derivative, and I get 2 times negative 32 is negative 64, t to the first. So I got the power rate, but you have to divide 32 by t. You got to divide by my new power. So then when I take derivative, that will cancel back out. And we can simplify this down. A negative 16t squared. Oh, what did I forget before? The negative 32, not the negative 32t squared divided by 2. You don't have to divide the t squared by 2, right? Yeah, you can end that whenever you want. Uh, and that comes from the algebra rule. which is the commutative property of multiplication. Okay. So I forgot there's supposed to be another plus c. But I don't want to use the same letter because above I said somewhere c was 12. But I don't, chances are this one's not 12. So I'm going to go with c1 for our next constant. Yeah, you could write minus c if you want, or some other letter. Probably don't want to use letters you're already using, like X and in this case T would be a bad letter to use. I like C's for constants because my brain just thinks constant. So, oh, that's a value that I'll figure out, hopefully. Would C be C1 be 80? Maybe. Yeah, so, so we're going to use our initial height, which will be S of 0. And that was 80 feet. So our initial height was 80. And now we're going to plug in 0 for t in our actual s equation. So s of 0 is 0 plus 0 plus c1. And we get c1 is 80. And we're ready to write the full s of t with that c1 value filled in. So that's negative 16t squared plus 12t plus 
80. And this is our position. Well, really height, or vertical position. All right, I still haven't answered the original question. When does it hit the ground? When does it hit the ground? Let's see, how long does it take for the package to hit the ground? So we have our S of T function. How do I take S of T and decide when it hits the ground? What height is the ground? Zero. Zero. So we're gonna set our S of T equal to zero to find when is height zero. So we're gonna set S of T equal to zero. We're going to find what t value has zero height. So we're intentionally setting zero equal to s of t. So to figure this out, let's multiply. Four seems like a common factor. So let's multiply by negative a fourth and make our, uh, basically our factor out of four and also make our t squared term positive. Ooh, those are minus, not plus anymore. All right, factor this. Tell me the t values. Hopefully this problem's nice, so it's either gonna be 4t times t, or it might be, so I don't know if it'll be that, or it'll be 2t, 2t. So to test out your algebra, probably algebra one skills or algebra two skills. And I can tell it'll be one positive, one negative for sure, because we have a negative um, product. I'll give you a big hint, it can't be this one, because your middle value is odd. So you can't have two times a number plus two times another number, it'll be even, it won't be odd. So that, that one's out. This is way too difficult. <laughs> What's another way to solve this? Wrap it. Just two other ways. Square. Complete the square, and the other one is quadratic. So pick your poison, go for it. Find the t value.
it 9 plus 320? Yeah. No. Yeah. 329 seems like it's the square root of something. Breaking any rules. I'm not getting caught breaking any rules. 17? 18 point something scary. Really? It's really close, yeah. but it's 18 point, uh, All right, so we'll leave it like this. All right, what's bigger, 3 or that square root of that number? The square root of the number. So basically, that number is way bigger than 9. So the square root is going to be way bigger than 3. So let's think about where these t values are. Here's 0. All right, one of them is positive, and one of them is negative. I know that because uh, square root 329 is way bigger than 3. So the little number 3 plus a big number is bigger than 0, and the little number 3 minus a big number is less than 0. So they're going to be actually centered at 3. So it's going to look something like this right here. So we have 3 plus square root 329 over 8. Is our parabola happy or sad? So where's our original? Right here. So this is what I'm looking at. Sad. So I'll graph it really quickly. There we go. Our initial height, we said, was 80. That's the y-axis intercept right there. We could get a maximum. Will it actually go up a little bit? Yeah, remember, your balloon is going up. So when you actually drop it, we said our initial uh, velocity was 12 feet per second oh. up. So yes, it. Not very long. This is not. It well, that gets into relativity, where as soon as you drop it, it will look like it's uh, not moving and then falling, because you're ascending. Uh, relativity, relativity starts to hurt your brain when you think about, well, what does falling mean? Because we're flying through space, so we're moving really fast right now. Even when you're stuck in traffic, you're going 24,000 miles, whatever units that's you're in. Your that's that, yeah, that's just rotating. Right. So there is no, unfortunately, there is no absolute velocity. We just pretend that the Earth is flat and not moving in math and physics. <laughs> right? Look, I drew the ground. It's flat. It's not only flat, it's actually a line. It's not even a plane. Now, it depends on what you're doing. If you're going to orbit the Earth, obviously, you don't want to use a flat Earth model. <laughs> or it's probably not going to work out so well. It just depends on what you're doing. Oh, do we figure out, so, how long does it take? The answer to that is this interval right here, from 0 to that number right there. So it's, the answer is that many seconds. So we'll answer in a sentence. It takes 3 plus square root 329 over 8 seconds to hit the ground. Seems like a lot of seconds for 80 feet off the ground. It's divided by 8. So. Oh, it's divided by 8. Never mind. That's reasonable then. I was like, that's like almost 20 seconds. That seems like a really long, but divided by 8, that's like two, 2 to 3 seconds. That's reasonable. Oh, let's get really fancy. I'm going to do a grid. 2.6. Four seconds. Two point six four? Yep. All right. <laughs>
So, whoa, we don't want to be a 5 6. So that's way too far ahead. No. <laughs> that's not an improvement. No, that's not. All right, let's start at 5 of 1. That seems like a lot more reasonable. Mm. Now I want my grid. All right, there we go. <laughs> so you don't need graph paper necessarily, but I'm going to draw a lot of graphs and estimate things on graphs. So I'm using graph paper. You can just draw little grid marks on your graph. So I'm going to draw as accurate of a graph as I can of the x squared function from 0 to 2. And then we're going to use this nice grid to estimate the area. Over? Under? Under. Under. Uh, specifically between fx and the x axis. So we got 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4. So we're cutting off 0 and 2. So there's a uh, vertical, you can think of a vertical line at 0 and 2. The vertical line at 0 is not very impressive. It doesn't need to be very long. But the vertical line on the right side, you do need to close the region off. So we go 0 to 2. It could close it off at 0 and 2. All right, so I want you to take 10 seconds and give me a number. You better not go bigger than 8 or less than 0. Those are unreasonable. Are you saying the gas is right now? Yeah, do your best to come up with a number, a decimal number, of how much area is in here. And I guarantee you it's between 0 and 8. Two. All right, so what are some... Oh, let's take a vote. How about that? <laughs> oh, but then we can only vote if we pick a finite number of choices. But there's an infinite pos number of possibilities. So that probably won't work out so well. Why don't we just do under, like, we can choose in between intervals. So, like, in between 1 and 2, and then we can choose. All right, so who thinks it's less than 1? between 1 and 2, 2 and 3, oh, I have not thought yet, hold on, all right, between 2 and 3, between 3 and 4, all right, so probably somewhere between 2 and 4, anybody said bigger than 4, all right, so we all think it's between 2 and 4, okay, now let's talk about how you could come up with a reasonable estimate for this. Well, if you connect 0, 0, and 4, and 2, 4, that will give you a triangle. So we can do a triangle, which would be an over. Everything we're going to do now is going to be an estimate, so they'll all be wrong. <laughs> Unless we get very lucky with our estimate. But generally, they're going to be wrong. So, so we can make a triangle, which is base is 2, height is 4. 2 times 4 is 8, divided by 2 is 4. All right, so that would be one way to do it. What is another way we can estimate the area? Count squares. Count squares. That's a little tricky because, like, obviously that's 1, but 
Is this a half, a third, a fourth? What's happening? Would that one and that one equal one as well? It looks like you could say these two put together are one. And then let's say this one plus the other one is about a half. That plus that tiny little sliver that we get up there. So I'm going to guess 2.5. All right, there is a nice way to do this systematically. And I'm going to draw this out actually twice as big so we can write more on it. So we just estimated using squares all over the place. Let's use rectangles instead. So what we're going to do is chop this up, and we're going to go vertically and chop it up into slices. And we're going to estimate the height of each rectangle when we do it. So let's break this into two pieces, two rectangles. And we're going to split it up. If we're going to break it into two rectangles, we'll obviously split it up right in the middle. So now we have a question, what height should I use for the left rectangle? So it would be reasonable to use anywhere from 0 to 1 or something in between. I'm going to choose left endpoint, and I know that will be a very serious underestimate. But you have to wait to see where we're going. So I'm going to use left endpoint. It turns out using left endpoints, midpoints, or right endpoints won't matter because of what we're going to be doing after this. So these are all estimates. They're all going to be wrong. So I'm going to go left endpoint. I'm going to draw the two rectangles. First rectangle is not very impressive. It has a height 0. Second rectangle has a height 1. So our estimate. So we have 0 plus 1 is 1. We can tell very obviously that's way too low. So let's estimate this was using two rectangles. So if I say you have to use left endpoints and you have to use rectangles, how can I get a better estimate? We've got to keep the same method. We're just going to cut into smaller pieces. So I think four rectangles is a reasonable way to go next. So let's go into four rectangles. So I will draw out the <coughs> four rectangles. The first rectangle is still height 0. The second rectangle is right there. The third rectangle is there. And the fourth rectangle is right there. So write down the areas of each rectangle. Give you a hint, all the widths are a half. That's not hard to see. All the widths are one half.
what height do I have at one half? How do I figure out what that height is? Yep, one half, plug it into your function. So I'm going to write, so our first one was f of zero is our initial height. And now our next height is f of one half, right there, times the width, which is one half, plus, I could write down one for the height, but I'm going to keep it consistent and write f of one. So that'll be the y value of that rectangle, times a half, plus last one, f of three halves, times one half. What can I do with all these one halves everywhere? Factor it out, so everything's times a half, let's factor it out, make our math or our life a little bit easier. So we're gonna be left with f zero plus f one half plus f two halves plus f three halves and keep the pattern going. I'm writing everything as halves right here. Why is that? Fractions suck unless you have common denominator and it's pretty easy to see what's going on. And of course we have that half that we factored out right there. So we can compute this f of zero is zero squared plus a half squared plus, now I'll simplify that down, one squared plus three halves squared times a half. All right, any questions on four rectangles? Are we just gonna keep going smaller and smaller rectangles? Yes. Infinity? Yeah, for the next yeah. 60 years. What is the use for like, an application? Uh, we're, there's an estimate. So I think you should be able to tell if you went to probably 1,000 rectangles, you'd be pretty accurate. Right. At, at this level of zooming in and out, you probably couldn't tell if I drew 1,000 rectangles in here. Uh, and especially because the resolution of the screen is in this area is probably not even 500 pixels wide. So you wouldn't be able to tell the difference if I drew a thousand rectangles versus fill the shape in. So that would be a very accurate estimate right there. And that's just a thousand, uh, adding up a thousand numbers basically. So I'd be able to tell how much area is under a curve. Is your question why do I want to know the area under a curve? Yeah. Oh. Well, you have to wait for that. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. All right, so I want you to write down the formula for eight rectangles. It's not that bad. Remember, fractions suck unless you have common denominators. So what denominator do you need to break this into eight pieces? Four. That is correct. So basically our total distance is two, so two eighths is a fourth. So you just take your distance, cut into eight pieces, and that's how big each piece is. So we're gonna be using fourths here.
So that's a lot of Fs of stuff to write out. So who has seen summation notation before, or sigma notation? Not too many? OK. All right, so it's painful and tedious to write out really anything past two or three, in my opinion. So we use summation notation. And I'll talk about that briefly. Summation notation uses a sigma. It's a capital sigma. I don't really know how to describe how to write it. It's sort of like a sideways M. That's probably the best way, sideways capital M. That's probably the best way to think of it. So you write a large sigma at the bottom. A lot of times you're going to use the letter I. Usually I, J, or K are common ones to use. And there's a start value and an end value. You generally want those to be integers overall. They probably shouldn't. If they're not integers, you should probably work harder to make them integers. Oh, this is just the letter I, not not the I, uh, the imaginary I. So you won't see that until you take, I think, differential equations or linear algebra, maybe, will probably be the next time you see that. So not in calculus at all? No, I don't think you see it at all in calculus. Uh, you can use it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You, you, don't, you won't see it, and I'll talk about it one time in Calc 2. It's optional to use with partial fractions. All right, summation notation. And then you have uh, some expression of i. So I'll just call it f of i. So you have some function. And what this is is f of 1, or f of whatever your start number is, plus f of start plus 1. And you just keep adding one to that initial value until you get to f of the end value right there. So you're just adding up, and you're just plugging in the next bigger integer until you hit end. So that is summation notation. And we're going to use that because it's very difficult to write down large sequences, a large series, and it's possible to write down infinite ones. It's very easy in summation notation for infinite. There's an infinite number of terms written down, summed together right there. Where do you stop? You don't stop, you keep going. So that is infinite. This case will be F0 plus F1 plus, and you just say dot, 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 and don't put anything on the other side. It keeps going forever. And one last little bit of notation. We're going to call the uh, width. So the width of the rectangle is going to be called delta x. Which means change in x. So that's how much you're going to change from one x value to the next x value to the next x value. <coughs> 